Good evening, everybody. My name is David Laviv. I am a campus advisor for Camera on Campus. Thank you for joining our program tonight. It's an exciting conversation on Buhari and Jewish history and culture. And we thank you all for registering or tuning in on Facebook Live as well. So as noted, we have Facebook Live going on. You could submit questions there and you'll also be able to submit questions here on Zoom if you've registered for the Zoom link um, in the Q&A function. Let's make sure that we ask our questions there and that you also have an opportunity to just fill out questions in the Q&A function throughout the event. You do not have to wait until Q&A starts. So if you are listening to the speaker and, and a question pops up in your head, you can definitely just add that in um, to the Q&A function and we'll receive the question. And then just some other housekeeping um, items is that this is in webinar format, so you'll only be able to comment through the Q&A or chat functions, just to remind everyone of this. And then before we do start our conversation and uh, the, today's event, I'm going to introduce our camera fellow, Maya Rubin, who did an amazing job preparing this event and reaching out to students. Um, Maya is a camera fellow, and then without further ado, I'll let Maya introduce our speaker and tonight's topic. Great, thanks so much, David. Uh, hi, everyone. Hope you're all holding up okay during these crazy times. Uh, it's my honor to introduce you to Menashe Kaimov, who will be sharing more about the history and culture of the Bukharian Jewish community with us today. Menashe is an adjunct professor in the Jewish Studies Department um, with a specialty in history and culture in the Bukharian Jews uh, at CUNY Queens College. He was born in a city along the Silk Road in Samarkand, Uzbekistan, where his ancestors lived for over 2,000 years, which makes Menashe's Jewish identity simultaneously Bukharian, Sephardic, Mizrahi, and Russian speaking. Menashe is a fourth generation community organizer and is founding director of the Bukharian Jewish Union, um, an organization for young professionals in their 20s and 30s. He is also the founder of the only online Bukharian dictionary, askbobo.org, and the founder of the Jewish Silk Road Tours Walking, Jewish Silk Road Tours, sorry, Walking Tours in NYC. Menashe has presented on the history of the Bukharian Jews in numerous conferences in the United States, Canada, Russia, Uzbekistan, Vienna, and South Africa. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I will let Menashe take it away. Thank you very much, Maya. Thank you, David, and thank you, uh, Camera on Campus, um, for inviting me uh, for, for another, another talk, and I'm uh, really, really honored to be here. Um, at this time, and also thank you all the attendees and, and those of you who are tuning in on Facebook. I see your numbers are going up. So uh, thank you for, for, for your interest in, in learning about uh, Bukharian Jewish community and learning about um, Bukharian Jews and, uh, and um, my particular story about um, being growing up Jewish in Uzbekistan. So I would like to share my screen. There you go. So growing up Jewish in Uzbekistan, what did that mean for me? So we're gonna talk about that. Um, how is it like to, to grow up Jewish in Uzbekistan? And also we'll talk about today about uh, some current events uh, about Bukhan Jewish history, um, about the Bukhan Jewish culture. We'll talk about um, um, many different things that how Bukhari Jewish community be able to preserve who they are um, living on the outskirts of the of the of the of the world in Central Asia. So, um, and we're all going to try to do this within the thirty minutes, and then we and then we will do a Q and A. Uh, and as David mentioned, if you would like to ask any question, just jump right in and, and type it up, and we'll be able to. Um, we'll be able to answer it. Okay, so before we go, I would like to go uh, over some language and definitions, right? So we're gonna be talking about uh, what does it mean to be Ashkenazi Jew, Sephardic Jew, Mizrahi, and Bukharian Jew, and all of those things you're gonna be hearing as part of this conversation. And also not a one big of a piece that I like to do, I like to show people a world map because I, um, you know, uh, there, there has been a study said that if an individual looks at a map for, uh, for at least once a day, the worldview becomes much, much wider. And um, um, they become just, you know, different type of a person 
to look at, at people and cultures and languages. So the area we're actually going to be talking about, oops, would be this area right over here. Um, and I'll and I have a map that's going to be a close up. Um, so let's let's just jump in. Ashkenazi Jews, right? Been hearing a lot about Ashkenazi Jews, uh, but where is the term actually comes from? So I got this definition from a Jewish a virtual library, and um, uh, basically uh, the the Ashkenaz the term Ashkenaz uh, become uh, identified as a primarily as a German custom, right? It's a the descendants of a German Jews, and the Germany at that time when when the term was created didn't look exactly the same way the way we know um, Germany on a map today. So the Ashkenazi Jews are Jews from, from Germany, Jews from Europe, um, and we've been particularly using that terminology um, here in, a, in the United States as well. Um, this is a, a, a map that I usually like to show just to kind of have uh, some sort of a visual because I do believe there is a lot of visual learners. Um, and if you look at this map, um, it kind of breaks down where the Ashkenazim lived, where the Sephardim lived, and where Mizrahi. It's not really accurate map, um, but at least it gives you some sort of a some sort of a piece. If you see a, a circle over here, that's the Kazakhstan and, and Turkmenistan and Tajikistan that it's not included um, as part of Mizrahi, and it should be. This is Uzbekistan right here. And also in North Africa, there's um, um, and, and Syria should should have also been part of a Mizrahi and also part of Sephardic. So it's not really an accurate map, but at least it gives you some visual. Sephardic Jews are Jews from Sephardat. Um, it's a Jews that came from uh, Iberian Peninsula, and it's dating back to Roman period of 1 CE. Um, during that time, it was a flourishing Jewish community that had scientists, artists, um, and even under Islam rule in 19th century, um, they'd be able to flourish and, 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 um, and bringing lots of different um, um, ideas to, 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 to life. And obviously that follows with uh, 1495, the Spanish Inquisition, and where we see a lot of Sephardic Jews getting kicked out from, from Spain um, and kind of getting integrated within the North African and Middle Eastern Jews that today... Um, um, where the whole idea of the term Mizrahi and Sephardic Jews or Sephardic and Mizrahi Jews actually would come from where people could share both of those identities but also sometimes that umbrella creates just because it's sometimes easier to talk about it even though the Sephardic Jewish community and Mizrahi Jewish community within those communities uh, there are many 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 different groups and sects and 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 um and um and people and I and we, we'll talk about that in a, in, a, in a bit. So I found another this picture uh, that was created by uh, Benjamin Rosenbaum. And he actually put together his family history map and how they migrated. And he also had another attempt of showing where the Ashkenazim lived or where they come from, uh, where the Mizrahi Jews, where the Sephardic Jews, and Bnei Israel and Ethiopian. Um, that's another visual attempt just to show you what it might look like. And then finally, Mizrahi Jews. Um, uh, Mizrahi Jews is a term that used to describe Jewish community that origins come from Middle East, North Africa, Western Asia, Central Asia, and Caucasus. The term literally means Eastern, uh, which dates back all the way to Babylon exile in 586 BCE. And uh, Mizrahi traditions can be traced um, back to the first holy temple. And actually, a lot of things that my ancestors have been doing. Um, um, and if you read Torah and you read any uh, any different things that uh, Jewish people were doing during the time of a uh, temple, um, my answer still do, which is a uh, uh, fascinating uh, traditions that being passed on from generations to generations. And uh, historically, Mizrahi Jews resided in what is it known now, um, Muslim and Arab countries. However, the community is much, 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 much older than Islam itself. And, um, and you will see historically, you know, how the Jewish community, especially the Bahá'í community, came to Central Asia uh, way before the Islam um, came there. Okay, that's the, um, so, and, and one last term that I want to um, uh, talk to you about it is how I view a Jewish community. And for me, Jewish community is, is like a pomegranate. Um, I know a lot of people try to uh, talk about, uh, well, sometimes I hear, some people talk about Jewish community as a mosaic, 
which is which is a terminology where you have a mosaic and you have uh, little pieces which represents each community and together it becomes nice beautiful uh, picture uh, or nice beautiful um, um, art where I would uh, say that uh, to me the Jewish community is like pomegranate and it's not because of 613 um, mitzvot that people need to do but it's all about how each community has its own separate communities but they're all part of the same tribe or part of the same people um so one of the biggest questions and the reason why i started doing this work and was was pushing me to do this work is this very question that you see uh, right now why am i bukharian if i'm not from bukhara i was born in samarkand which is you see in the red circle right here that's that, that's what samarkand which is in uzbekistan bukhara is in yellow so why am i bukharian if i'm not from bukhara i'm from samarkand um and um, the, uh, the short answer to it, because we don't want to go in into all 16 courses uh, class that I teach in Queens College, is basically simple that Bukharian Jews and Persian Jews are two Jewish communities that identify themselves by the empires they lived in, rather than by, um, by, by countries they come from. So, for example, Syrian Jews come from Syria, Egyptian Jews come from Egypt, Russian Jews come from Russia. Belarusian Jews come from Belarus, right? Uh, Ukrainian Jews come from Ukraine. But Bukharian Jews come from Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and Turkmenistan. So you don't see a Jewish community from Central Asia would identify as Uzbeki Jew or Kazakhstanian Jew or Turkmenistanian Jew. We identify as Bukharian Jews. Why? Because this area, we're talking about a little bit of Iran, a little bit of Afghanistan, this whole area used to be called a Bukharian emirate. Emirate, which means also an empire. So that's where this community comes from. And then you see these parts here, um, Azerbaijan and Georgia. So Georgian Jews come from Georgia and Azerbaijanian Jews or Kafkazi Jews are also, um, they're calling themselves um, uh, Kafkazi Kafkaz Jews or, or um, uh, coming from Azerbaijan right over here. Or Gorski Yevrei, also calling themselves mountain Jews. Um, so, um, really brief store history. Uh, let me look at the time. So, very brief history. Where and how, what, how do we end up even um, um, in Central Asia? So, before we go into it, I want to talk about a, a very brief history. We know about there was two kingdoms, right, in, Ju uh, in Judea and Samaria. The top one, which is on the north, the Assyrian Empire takes advantage of the situation because these two kingdoms were in, in a somewhat war amongst each other. The two, two Jewish kingdoms were um, in a war of each other. Um, Assyrian Empire takes advantage of it, conquers this land, and takes um, 10 Jewish tribes and disperses them all around the world. That's where we have the term about 10 lost tribes. And then what happens in this area? Um, Nebuchadnezzar which is who conquers Judea and, uh, and, and destroys the first Jewish temple in 586 BC. And then Jewish people are all ended up in Babylon, which is in current day of, excuse me, Iraq. So Jewish people live there for quite um, um, time. And then Persian kingdom, uh, Persian empire emerges and then Tyrus the Great um, di um, dynasty absorbs the Babylon into his kingdom, becoming a Babylonic Persian empire in 539 BCE. And he made an interesting, an interesting thing for the Jewish people. He allows Jewish people to move back and build their temple. So the small percentage of people went back, but the vast majority of people stayed in Babylon. Um, and, and, then, and then the small percentage of people that went back, that we built a second temple. But the vast majority of people that stayed, um, the Tyrus the Great, what he did, another thing was he, um, and, that's, and that's where the, uh, what he did was he needed a skilled people in the outskirts of his empire, which at that time was Merv and Baum. And I'm going to show you in a minute where that is. I um, just want to show you a little bit of a timeline because we don't have that much of a time to go over. But that's the time I we're talking about. Babylon exile, pre-Islamic Iran, different 
different empires. We have Alexander the Great Empire, Susanid Empire. Then we have an Arab conquest or early Islam during this area, seventh century up until uh, you know twelfth to thirteenth century. Um, then revival of the Persian culture happening, um, Mongolian Empire invasion, and then uh, Timurid Empire, which is also called Tumur Lang. Then we have Sunni and Shiites dynasties um, in 1502 until 1736. Um, and then the last emir um, 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 was kicked out from Bukhara, from Bukharian Emirate in, in, in 1920. And then we have Tsarist Russia right over here. And then we have Soviet Union, USSR. Okay. So how did Jews end up in Central Asia? And I already answered that question right before which is that Tyrus the Great needed a, a skilled people on the outskirts of his land. And where was the outskirts of his land? Right over here, Merv and Baal. So Merv is in the current day of Turkmenistan, and Baal is in the current day of Afghanistan. So that was the outskirts of his land, and that's how the Jewish community ended up in this area. That happens to be today where the Bukharian Jewish people live. So here's Bukhara, here's Samarkand. So when Alexander the Great conquers this area, he moves um, his kingdom all the way further to east, and that's how the Jewish people continue traveling. But how did they get there? They get there by the Silk Road. And a lot of times we confuse Silk Road with, with that it started in China. Um, it got the name from it and it stuck from it, but the Silk Road actually <clears throat> started as a royal road that the Tyrus the Great created to transport his goods and transport his information. And he did it up until Mir and Balch. And then when Alexander the Great comes in, he expands it to Europe. He expands it a little bit here. Um, and then the Chinese um, um, uh, dynasties join in, and that's how it creates it, uh, um, uh, a Jewish um, uh, a Silk Road empire. Um, Silk Road, I'm sorry. So now we know how the Jewish people got there through Silk Road. We know um, that the Cyrus the Great sends them there. Um, and then after that, what I was doing, I was doing my research. Um, and as part of my research, I was Googling different uh, information and tried to get information about Bukharian Jews. And I got a lot of different um, answers. So I start, um, um, and I want to share with you what I actually found. So one of the things that I found was the excavation that happened in 1954 up to 1956 by Soviet Union. An uh, archaeologist uh, found um, stones where it had a scripture of Yaakov Bar Yaakov. And at that moment, and they, they believe and, uh, that this was from, from uh, second and third centuries. And the, these artifacts they found in Merv, which is in current day of, of Turkmenistan. And we saw that. And that was where the first Jewish community was there. And then I said to myself, all right. All right, that could be a proof. First of all, how we know it's Jewish, maybe because it's a Hebrew letter is fine. But what is it out there that could prove this, this, that, that this is not just one incident where there was a one small community and they all died out, but the actual Jewish presence was there in that area longer than just those times. Then I had uh, an information about, in, in Talmud, where it talks about um, in Abu Dazara 31b, the Rabbi Shmuel Bar Bizna happened to come to Marguan and he brought, they brought him wine and he did not drink, they brought him beer, the whole conversation about all of these different drinks. But what was, the, what was the biggest conversation about it and why is it matter for us in learning about Bukhan Jewish history is because Marguan, many historians believe, is present day of Merv, which where this artifact was found, which is a near Bal Amali, which is in Turkmenistan. So that two pieces show us that Jewish presence in that area was there for, um, you know, since the beginning of the destruction of the first temple. And that proves the, the, the conversation that we talked about that Cyrus the Great sends the Jewish people on the outskirts of the land. And then we also know about the, the Purim story, right? And um, the, the, the reside over 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia. If you look at the map, Central Asia is part of that, uh, those provinces. Um, and then obviously we found, uh, I found a picture about the traveler 
that was going from um, um, from Israel to Egypt. This is a little bit earlier time. We're talking about 1800s. But I'd kind of start thinking about it. Why, what he was doing in Egypt, what is it, the way he was going. And later on, I found that there was establishment of the Bukharian Jewish quarter before the establishment of Israel, um, of the state of Israel that uh, current day we, we, we talk about current day. And there's also documents that show that the Jewish, Bukharian Jewish people went from Bukhara, managed to get to, Ju to Jerusalem, purchased their land, and, um, and be able to establish their quarter. That's called, it's, it's a Shonat Bukhari, and it's in Mea Sharim. It's an interesting story because usually we hear by the European media um, in the European kind of perspective that the Muslims were there first and then the Jews came, or uh, which is not in the case of Central Asia and Bukhari Jews. Um, and then the second thing that we hear that the, that the white European Jews come to Israel and take away the land from the, from the, from the, from the, from the Arab world, which in this concept where the Bukharian Jews came and bought the land from the local people, and there is information and documents out there for it, gives us and shows us um, um, the information about it, that the concept of the Europeans coming in and taking over the land is not necessarily 100% true. Um, this is something about the language, but I think at this point, moment, I would like to um, uh, sum up. And uh, if anybody has any questions, we I will take I will take those questions at this moment. Well, thank you so much, Menashe. It's really incredible to learn more about the rich history of the Bukharian Jews, especially because it's not something that we hear about a lot in the United States. Um, so I wanted to actually kick off the Q&A. Um, I was curious, how did Bukharian Jews view the rise of the Zionist movement and what was their relationship to the state of Israel in that context? So if I may share the screen again, I actually have a few photos to share. Um, so the Zionist basically, give me one second. So the Zionism part of it, um, so the Jewish people, in Central Asia, always knew that they need to return back to Israel. So the idea, the Zionists, when the Zionist uh, movement started active, actively telling people, you know, we got to move, we got to, this is our opportunity to do it, Bukharian Jewish people were already there. So um, it did help to send more Jewish people because it opened up the doors when the Zionist movement coming in into Central Asia. But the Bukharian Jewish community were there, the, the establishment of the quarter, I'll show you a picture. This is one of the synagogues, 1895, that was established there and in the Bukharian Jewish quarter. Um, the community there were already from 1850. So they, they start buying properties and then expanding. And this is one of the synagogues. You see the guy in a hat. That's me bringing a group of teenagers from New York, group of teenagers from Israel, who are Bukharian Jews, and we together explored that specific area. I want to show you another picture. Here you go. That's a house of Alisho Yagudayev. So he built this house because he, um, the, basically, by the way, that this house was built for Mashiach. So if anybody in the audience believed that they are Mashiach, then this is your house. It's a nice prime real estate. Please go and take it. I'm not sure if he st uh, stuck up some food on it, but um, he did He did build a house. So Basically, the idea of Zionism of coming back to Israel and also uh, the religious continuity of the Jewish people and believing in Mashiach and all that stuff kind of was going hand to hand. Wow, incredible. Thank you. Um, I'm sure if anyone is Mashiach here, they will surely take advantage of that one. Um, so you mentioned something about uh, Jews from New York and bringing them to um, Israel. So I was curious if you could speak a little bit more about the Bukhari and Jewish community in the United States, particularly in Queens. Sure. Um, so, so I usually play this game uh, with my audience. I know it, with the Zoom, it's a little bit harder to do, but the game is very simple. Where we ask, I ask the question, maybe we could do it with you and you know, we could uh, see what the viewers will say. Um, where do you think the biggest community of Bukhari and Jews today? Let's see, let's guess. 
Um, I would probably say Israel. Good. Right. So it's 120,000 to 150,000, depending which fundraiser you attend. Okay. So it's, <laughs> so it's, it's, it's that, but it's about around that number where you would say the second largest behind Jewish population. United States. United States. Where would you think in particular? I'm going to go with New York because that's what you mentioned in your presentation. Good. Perfect. Queens, New York, right? We have 70,000 Bukharian Jews living in Queens, New York today. Um, the rest of them are spread around the country. So the second largest after Queens, New York would be... New York City? Phoenix. No? Oh, I broke my streak. <laughs> Phoenix, Phoenix, Arizona. Phoenix, Arizona. Wow. Would not like, have guessed that. Right, so second largest Bukharian Jewish population there. Where's the third largest, what do you think? Right after, so we have New York, we have Arizona, what's next? LA, maybe? We have people in California, in San Diego. Uh, okay. There is a Bukharian community there, but the third largest would be Atlanta, Georgia. Interesting. Then we have Bukharian Jewish community in, um, in uh, Florida. Um, you see all the hot spots, basically. Um, but, um, we have in Ohio, Cleveland. I don't know how they got there, but they are there. And when I say Bukharian Jewish community, it's not just one Bukharian guy with like a with like a Bukharian rope and uh, and that's it. We're talking about a community where we have a rabbi, we have uh, some sort of a synagogue, either our own infrastructure or like a renting, and there is a cemetery, but Bukharian cemetery. So like when I'm saying community, that means there's a some sort of infrastructure, some sort of structural thing. Um, then uh, we have, I said, San Diego, and then also we have um, in Toronto. That's another Bukharian Jewish Papua. That's actually, in, if we're counting in the world, we say Israel first, America overall has 100,000, so that's second. Where would be the third? Canada, maybe? Toronto specifically? Yeah. Toronto specifically would be fourth. Wow. Fourth. Interesting. Where would, where would be the third? Let's try around the oh, world. Oh no, around the world. Maybe still in Uzbekistan, potentially. Potentially, no. 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 <laughs> <laughs> but we'll talk about that. So I always say, if you learn about Bukharian Jewish community, you learn about history of other Jews. The third largest Bukharian Jewish community around the world would be in Vienna. Interesting. Wow. How did they get there? It's during the time of the movement when the Soviet Jews were moving out, and that was the one of the transit routes, right? So they, they went to Italy, waited there for six months, and then they come to America. And then later on, they were going to, to, to Vienna. And Bukharian Jewish family, usually it's a big family. So if you have, let's say, five brothers, and uh, two of them would go to Israel, two of them will wait to come to America, one of them will stay in Vienna and kind of build up the community this way, and some would come back to Vienna, and other would go. But that's, so we have fourth largest, right? We have Israel, America, Ca Ca uh, Vienna, Canada, and the fifth largest, let's try it. Oh man, I feel like I'm running out of, <laughs> running out of countries. <laughs> um, um, United Kingdom. In, oh, I forgot about the UK, yes. So then there's also the Bukharian community in Germany and there's Bukharian community um, in Uzbekistan. So a lot of people are still asking whether or not there are Bukharian uh, Jews still in Uzbekistan. So there's about 3,000 Jewish people in Uzbekistan, majority of which Ashkenazi Jews. Interesting. So if there aren't, I'm just going to check the Q&A box to make sure there aren't any ones that I'm missing, but I do have a follow-up question on kind of the diaspora Jewish um, Bukharian community. Sure. Um, are there big cultural differences? Um, sorry, I think I just need to close that tab. Are there big cultural differences between um, the community in Israel versus the community in the United States, like each country that the Bukharian Jewish community has settled down in? Or do you think that it's pretty cohesive? I love your questions. And I love um, that we are going back and forth. Maya, you should do all of my, uh, you know, <laughs> Q&As for all my uh, talks that I'm doing for the rest of the week. Um, good question. I love it because it, um, there are differences. So, for example, when we brought two teenagers from New York and from Israel, the teenagers were talking about two different things, which was 
from New York, people, teams were thinking about which college they're going to go to. And in Israel, they were thinking which branch of the army they're going to go to. So that's like a whole new uh, piece there. And another, another part is the language, right? The language about the, 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 the dictionary that I created was specifically for American Jewish population, Bukharian Jewish population. Why? Because we're losing our language here. So in Israel, they tend to keep the Bukharian language a little bit longer. And Bukharian language is an actual language. It's not just, um, it's like Yiddish or like Ladino, um, where it consists of um, Hebrew, it consists of, of Farsi, it consists of Aramaic. Uh, some people say that there is also Urdu and some Pashtun, which is mixed languages and kind of um, talks about that. Um, I think another differences would be, um, um, you know, the view on 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 the skilled jobs versus going to universities. And so, like in America, there are more and more people are, you know, g g going to colleges and universities. And there's a lot of people you might see. Um, I don't know if in USA, um, in in this university that there are behind you, but I'm sure you could start asking around. Sorry, yes, I, I was muted. Yes, of course. I'm sure. I'm sure there's some Jews scattered there. everywhere. Jews everywhere. Um, so I was curious. Speaking of the Bukhari language, um, I know that you designed that website, um, the online dictionary. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about like your process in designing it, or like what drove you to create that website. So. The dying of the language was because I really believe if you and I'm sharing on screen on purpose, I really believe that, you know, knowing a language automatically gives you an access to a culture and gives you an access of a history, any language, right? So we, we speak English and we tend to should learn the history of the United States of America. Otherwise, it's like or matter of fact, like some sort of understanding of United Kingdom to understand that that's where the language also works. So the biggest challenge was that the Bukharian Jewish community, there is people that want to learn about the language, but there was no information, there is no access. And there are dictionaries that were published and mm, people who are buying them, it was just on the shelf. So I said, what if we have that dictionary that was printed in print, let me digitalize it and put it as a Google search. So you type it up a word like say mother and it's going to be mada modar or ona or modar or you do father and it's going to be padar and you're like whoa that's cool and you could just type in one or two words and it brings it up maya do you read hebrew i don't want to put you on a spot i i can read it but i can't necessarily understand it <laughs> so let's say if somebody understands in this group and i have to read it over here it says yakumim ki medonad yakumim man medonad and a lot of times when we read it and there are Hebrew speaking people, they're like, Menashe, this is ain't Hebrew. You're reading it. There's Hebrew. Word, but what are you saying? We don't get it. So this is Bukharian language. So a lot of times people were asking, Bukharians, what, how would they write stuff? They, we would write stuff in Hebrew. And that, this is a song from, from, from Pe uh, Pesach, from Haggadah, where we, you know the song where we sing, uh, who knows one, I know one, or like in Hebrew, it's like, so this is exactly the same song, just Bukharian, and the way we call, usually singing it is like, Yakumim ki medonad, Yakumim man medonam, Yakumim. So it's kind of gets you up and going, and it's a pretty exciting um, way to finish your uh, long, you know, Pesach Seder, uh, I would say. Um, yeah, of course. Always a great way to finish Seder. Um, we actually have a question in the chat from Shore. Um, it's about the Jewish community or the Bukharian Jewish community in San Diego. Uh, he's wondering how many Bukharian Jews are in San Diego and mainly in what area and if they have a rabbi there as well. Yes. So good question. So the numbers, it's a little bit harder because people have been moving back and forth, but I think it's about um, maybe 100 to 120 families. Um, so we, we could say roughly in each family, there's four people. 
So you could do the math that way. And um, from what I know in San Diego, they are all spread out. So it's not like, like in like in all in Queens, so they are in different areas. So what I could do is, um, person who asked my question, you could go on my Instagram, which is Menasha underscore, and um, send me that question, and I'll be able to get you exactly locations and information where and you know, who you could connect with. And we definitely have a rabbi there that that uh, you know does programming and connects with people and uh, and many other stuff there. So I'll be welcome to be a resource. And the person who asked is the Bukharian person? Um, I don't think so. Sorry. I don't <laughs> think the participants are allowed to speak, so I'm speaking for <laughs> them. Um, but I, I don't believe so. But new Bukharian friends. Okay. Just... Sorry. I... Sorry. It sounds Persian to me. Yeah, maybe. Sure, are you Persian? <laughs> we, I guess we won't find out on this Zoom call. Um, I was curious, so because you also were talking about how the Bihari language is dying out, and that's something that you guys are trying to preserve through this dictionary and you know other means. Um, how have other religious traditions, um, or how did Bihari and Jews maintain certain religious traditions in Soviet-controlled Central Asia? Amazing, amazing questions. So. Um, if we're comparing to other communities, or are we just talking about how it was? Um, either one, whatever. So, so I always get asked this question, how in the world, but they, people usually ask a little bit differently where they say, we know about Russian Jews or Soviet Jews that came from like Russia, like, you know, closer to Europe. And then we have a Bukharian Jews who also are part of the Soviet Union. And like, how come some of the Russians didn't preserve Judaism as much and you guys did? I would say for two reasons. I think when Soviets came to Central Asia, Muslims and Jews had one enemy, okay? Because they didn't allow us to practice Judaism, uh, eat particular food, do circumcision. So there was a lot of restrictions that Muslims um, and us wanted to continue doing it. And we kind of joined together and we did a lot of different things. Where in, in, in Russia, it was a Christian country even though communism didn't have religion, but people were really still in that mindset. And if you're a Jewish person, it was a little bit harder. And, and I think in, in, in Russia, the emphasis on education was so great that people said, I'm fine to put my Judaism on the side to become an engineer, to become a doctor, to become a philosopher, to become anything else. And I don't want to make sure that Judaism is not going to stop me to reach my goal. Where in Central Asia, yes, you become an engineer, and then what you do with that degree? You know, you have to go into Russia and St. Petersburg in order to build houses or to do whatever you want to do. And a lot of Bukhari and, and particularly also Mizrahi Jews, if you look at a historical map, we tend to stick and we tend to stay within our community. We don't want to like uh, live in San Diego, move to like Ohio and like start our business and come back. We'll usually try to maneuver and create opportunities within ourselves rather than with a, with a, just be there on our own. So I think those things really helped. And, um, and, and also because there's an article I just wrote um, in the Holy Shon website, our Judaism, um, we do a lot of things at home. So basically in order for us to build community, we don't have to go to synagogue. We go to synagogue to pray, but then the holidays, the culture, community, and everything, it's around, it's around the house. So if publicly we were not allowed to uh, wear a kippah or practice Judaism, we would do it at home. And I think that's what kind of preserved and kept us going. We also had a lot of underground yeshivas. Um, a lot of my, from my side, my great-grandfather, was sent to Siberia because he had his own like underground yeshiva. Obviously, never came back from that camp and he passed away there. So, wow! Thank you so much. Um, we do have a couple um, questions in the chat, or actually, short answered. Um, instead, he is half Yemeni Israeli and half Ashkenazi American, so not Persian, but but half and half. Um, 
All right, and we have a question from Anonymous um, in kind of related to this question as well. Um, can you talk a little bit more specifically about the Bukharian experience during the Soviet Union time period? So not necessarily focused on like preserving it, but just the experience in general. I tell you from what my father experienced, because I was born in 1987. So I was like uh, in 1991 is when Soviet Union collapsed. So I'll tell you my father experienced. And my father's experience is not just one unique experience. Every Jewish people in Central Asia and outside experienced that. And it was very simple. He was excellent musician and i'm not saying that just because he's my father i've seen his like you know uh certificates he finished this he finished that it was an amazing musician he he was playing um bayan which is like this um, um it's like a Arca arcadian but like has the buttons on the side from like age eight and and then he wanted to go to higher education and he need to go to to tashkent which is the capital of uzbekistan and when he did go there with all of his grades with all of his report cards they looked at him and they and, and we had five, fifth fifth paragraph in our passport and if you look at their passports today it says nationality and it says united states of america i have it you have it christian person has it anybody would have united states of america if they're citizens for us for jewish people it would say jew and then it would say Russian, or it would say Uzbek, or it would say Tajik. So they would identify your nation by your nationality. So Judaism for so for us living in Uzbekistan was nationality. It wasn't a religion. And when you look at that, and they look at it, and it says you're Jewish. So all of a sudden they said we're not accepting people from other cities. And he says, what do you mean? You just accepted my friend who has like lower GPA. He's like. 2.5 you accepted him and i have 4.0 he didn't accept me and then he came back to samarkand got discouraged and started doing other stuff um and there's a lot of information a lot of people out there so the jewishness will will get you basically you get to a certain rank very very softly but when if you would like to become let's say an executive director or like a director of a program then they looked at your passport and the Jewishness will not allow you to go that far. You would have to like take that fully out from yourself in order to be that. And I think that's why in Central Asia, people said, you know what, screw it. We'll just do whatever we want to do. And, and, and that kind of, some people did assimilate it completely where they forgot about their Jewish roots and upbringing just because they wanted to have that career. Um, and, and a lot, unfortunately, a lot of people had to, you know, get their identity, put it away before they get into any other places. Yeah, wow, it's really crazy to hear those stories now. Um, but incredible that the culture has persevered and tradition has been maintained, but still really sad to hear. Um, we do have another question in the chat. Um, switching gears a little bit, growing up in New York City, I have always known that the Bukharian Jewish community in Queens has been very good at preserving their culture. And I was wondering if you have some ideas why this community is so close knit and united. Good question. I would like to for always ask like a follow up question to the question that's I think that's just a Jewish thing to do. Um, but so it's remember my analogy when I was talking about pomegranate. That's what it comes from, where the idea is we as Jewish people and not just Bukharians, we are tribal people. You know, we always need to be around other Jewish people. Um, and whenever we live, wherever we live, we want to we want to maintain within ourselves for various reasons. But that's how we've been through our generations. So Bukharian Jews um, staying close-knit, staying next to them to themselves is because that's how we lived for centuries and for generations. For example, back in the day, if I would get married, which I am married now, um, I would live with my family, with my mom and my dad, until like, let's say, two or three years, save some money and then buy my own place. But if I buy my own place, it has to be around that same neighborhood. A, because for Shabbat, you know, it's a, it's a traditional community. You go to your family 
right, for Shabbat, and they come back to you. If you live somewhere else, now you be, won't be able to celebrate Shabbat together, and what's the point? And then, and there was no such a thing back then, we're talking about before Soviet Union, before Tsarist Russia, there was no such a thing as a secular Jew. It was you either a Jew who is observant or you're not Jewish, and period. So that's why living next to your family was always a thing. Um, we see similar things with Haredi communities, right? In, 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 uh, and we also see it with Hasidic communities. We also see that in Persian communities. I'm sure in LA, Iranian Jews live amongst themselves and they, you know, have that whole structure themselves. Ashkenazi Jews by default used to do and used to live the same way until we start migrating and moving around and, and the idea of less religious, more religious, conservative reform, and all of those different pieces came into play where new identities start bringing it in. And then that kind of gave us um, an opportunity to be more global Jews rather than communal Jews. And I think that's where that piece comes from. That's really interesting. That actually makes a lot of sense too. <laughs> um, all right, we have another question in the chat. Um, when people talk about post-USSR Jewry, Russian-speaking Jews from Russia and Ukraine are much more well-known compared to Bukharian Jews, Georgian Jews, or Kafkazi Jews. Um, why do you think this might be? I believe that this is, goes way, 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 way back of what was going on um, historically. How many of you, ah, nobody can answer. But let's say, Al, how many of you ever read a um, Persian poetry? Sorry, say that again. I, my audio cut out. How many of audience ever read Persian poetry, right? Not so many. Oh, yes. uh, yeah. Right? And then how many of us know about specific um, um, philosophers from, like, Europe? Uh, we, we could we could count a few, right? But how many philosophers do we know from from Middle East or from those areas? Not so many. Um, I think it's it's just historically there was the communities that were very well in 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 documenting their history, and there were communities who are creating history without documenting it. So there were people who uh, learning about, for example, there is a lot of people today that. Um, who not Bukhar, non Bukharians and they're writing books and they do um, conferences on Bukharian Jews and they're like documenting it. But there is not so many Bukharians who do this exactly the same work. So like they are making history, they're doing stuff, but they're not doing, you know, doing PhD in the Bukharian studies. Um, and I think that's another piece what brought me into this work is like somebody got to do this work because if we, if I'm not going to, do it and I'm not going to publish and I'm not going to put things around, nobody will. And I think that's a European thing. And we're talking about from different perspective, you know, in Europe, it's always that hierarchy of taking the history and taking the stories out there. And there are some examples, <clears throat> there are some examples where I teach in my history class where when Soviet Union, when Soviet Union came to Central Asia, they shut down Bukharian schools Bukharian history, the Jewish schools and, and language. We're talking about like, you know, 1950s. And they brought in and they said, we're going to talk about these specific philosophers. And in the Jewish schools, they brought in Ashkenazi um, 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 people. Like uh, they brought in Shalom Aleichem. They brought in like different, different people from that community. And when uh, one of the um, um, director asked and said, how about, Rabbi, you know, Shimon Chacham, or how about these other philosophers and these other poets? And they said, oh, they're very connected to religion and religion is not our thing. You know, Shalom Aleichem is Jewish, but he talks about other things, not just the religious things. Therefore, we will accept them. And we see that throughout the time happens more and more and more and more and more. And I think it's up to me and you guys who are interested in this topic is to talk about it and to get the word out there and to write about it and to kind of help people to to do that and i think it's it's important to get those those stories out there because if we want the pomegranate to be ripe 
we got to make sure that every corner of that, of those seeds will be red and ready to be eaten, you know, and not just uh, raw at one point and then ripe at another point. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's a great analogy and a really important, uh, really important to do as well. So, unfortunately, I just realized that was our last question. Um, so, thank you so much, Menashe, for taking the time to do this. Um, it's really incredible to learn more about the Bukharian Jewish community. I know I learned a lot. I did not know a lot coming into this. So, thank you, um, and I'm sure our audience enjoyed as well, even though they couldn't. They couldn't participate as um, we may have, um, they may have wanted to. So thank you. No problem. And I just want to share one slide so then people, if they would like to could keep in touch with me, um, I have that one slide that I would like to share. So if anybody would like to, um, you could always keep in touch. Oh, hold on. I'm not sharing the right screen. I think that's what it's supposed to be. All right, there you go. 